Okay, it says our Hangout is live. Welcome to Results on a Rampage for this Tuesday, September 30th, 2014. Two years, almost, after the Mayans had predicted the end of the universe with the long count calendar. The wheels were supposed to grind to a halt. Actually, the year, they were off by 50 years. The world actually ended in December of 1962. But I'll have to tell that story another time because that one is a different story, but it did, in fact, end at that time. Okay, so I'll tell the story of the end of the world then another day. Tonight, we're going to talk about what we said in the uh, program, which is what difference, I'm sorry, what do you really want? So it's as funny as that sounds, what do you really want is a question that I have to talk about with all of my clients all the time and uh, you'd be surprised how many people cannot answer that question in fact I had uh, a client I was speaking with yesterday in Toronto and the first question I asked him he had been employed for a long period of time and the employment came to an end he, he was you know not let go but negotiated a way out of a company he was an officer and so forth and he's trying to figure out right now whether or not to start a business or whether or not to uh, look for another job, J-O-B. <clears throat> and, you know, you can be happy either way, but it depends on what you want. So the first question I asked him when we started our discussion was, what do you want? There was a big, long pause, and he couldn't answer the question. <clears throat> so tonight, <clears throat> that's what we're going to talk about. What do you want? Because if you want to get results on a rampage, if you want to create extraordinary results, if you want to create results that are bigger than normal, <clears throat> that are above the average floating kind of mediocrity that we see is pretty standard in most of the world, then you have to know exactly what you want. So let's use a couple of um, silly examples. If I'm going to go to, if, if I'm going to take a trip and I don't know where I want to go, I'm going to have a lot of time, a lot of trouble going. If I don't care where I go, then any direction will suffice, north, south, east, or west. It's okay. But that is not consistent really with the idea of results on a rampage which is creating an intentional outcome <clears throat> one of the things that is going on I've got a couple of announcements I'll make real quickly right now and that is today is the second day of something I'm calling the two-day book challenge this might be interesting to you uh, watching here in the film strip and it might be interesting to you that are watching uh, later on YouTube the two-day book challenge is the following <clears throat> and this is very consistent with results on a rampage. I talked about it in the LA Talk radio show this afternoon as well. A two-day book challenge is writing a book in two days. Okay, I started yesterday morning. I'm going to finish tonight. Uh, it looks like I will make it. You know, there'll be a little left to do tomorrow. Uh, some, then there'll be editing and some other things. But the actual writing of the book will be essentially done. Uh, I have a few more hours of work to do still, so it's not something that you do without a lot of effort. But uh, not knowing where you're going would be like trying to do the two-day book challenge and not having any idea what you're going to write about. I'm going to write a book. <clears throat> and you get out a big piece of paper or you open your computer and, and you start working and it says, what am I going to write about? Uh, I don't know. You know, that's like that uh, scene from the Jungle Book. What, are you gonna, what do you want to do? Oh, I don't know. What are we going to do? Oh, I don't know. What do you want to do? And they go back and forth, those two silly little... Uh, things in the movie, right? They go back and forth doing that. I can't remember the vultures. That's what they were. And they go back and forth talking about what they're going to do, what they want to do, and you have no idea. So what you want, and I'm using a pin drop pause here on purpose, is a critical first step to getting any kind of results that matter. So let's talk about that. Why does it matter? The first thing I said, we're going to cover three things. Why it matters, and the it is knowing what you want. Uh, how to decide what you want, and then learn what to do about it. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. <clears throat> what do you want can be answered in a number of ways. If you walk into a grocery store and the clerk says to you, what do you want? You may have something particular in mind. I want a, a gallon of milk. Okay. That's easy. <clears throat> when you talk about your life, what you want, you have to weigh a bunch of things. Uh, one of the things that we do is something that businesses face all the time. We try to weigh too many variables. <clears throat> so, what do you want in life? 
oh, I don't know, I want to be important, I want to make a lot of money, I want to be loved, I want to serve, you know, people, I want to, and, you know, you can do a bunch of things. And so there are various means, and I'm going to talk about some of them really quickly, for deciding what you want. So I'm going to ask a question, I want you to think about it for a sec, and then I'm going to talk a little bit, and I'm going to ask all of you what you think. I want you to give me in 30 seconds a description of how you would decide what you want after I say a couple of things. So think about that. How would you decide what you want? And I'm talking about in the big picture scheme of things, not walking into, excuse me, walking into a grocery store and it's a gallon of milk. All right. <clears throat> so thinking about dying, leaving this life, and thinking about laying on a deathbed and s expressing either sadness or happiness about what you had or had not done. You've heard lots of people say, well, no one ever said, I'm sorry I didn't spend more time at the office, or I'm sorry I didn't make more money or anything. Those things are not usually expressed in that moment of extremity. So that gives, just, gives us a guide. Uh, <clears throat> at different times in our lives, I realize those things change when we're young and ambitious and we want to climb the corporate ladder. That's one set of goals and, and so forth. But deciding what you want at the time, so the first key is now. So thinking about it in the context of now, I, I'm hearing some noise. It may be me because I have windows open uh, because for the first time at this time in Phoenix, it's under 80 degrees and the sun's gone down and I can actually open the window. So if the noise is coming from here, I don't apologize. Uh, it may be a motorcycle coming from here and oh well. So the first thing to do is narrow the time frame down. What do you want right now? What do you want given your context right now? Not future, not trying to project what I want in 10 years or what I wished I had in the past. So the first thing is narrow the time frame. And the second thing is decide on the values you want to represent. So I want to make more money. Well, why? What would, what would happen if I had more money? Well, I could take care of my family better. Why do I want to take care of my family better? And you just sort of keep drilling down until you get to something that is at the core. So one of the questions I asked yesterday, what do you want? Well, I don't know. Well, okay, do you want to get another job? Well, I'm worried that in the job that I get, I may not be able to maximize my gifts and talents. Oh, so you want to maximize your gifts and talents. Yeah, I guess I do. Okay, so that's one thing you want. You want to maximize your gifts and talents. So now the choice doesn't become what you want. It becomes whether or not maximizing your gifts and talents happens best in another J-O-B or in starting your own business with the skills you've already developed. And so by using those kinds of questions, you can help narrow down the field of what you want. Analysis paralysis is the enemy of action in this case, and I know lots of people that have spent six months or a year messing around, and when they're done, they're no closer to deciding what they want than they were to start with. The real result of that is inaction and that you die with your music inside of you. All right, so I've said a couple of things now, and I want your input, anyone that wants to, on how you decide what's important in the now. Manny, you unmuted, but we cannot hear you. Cannot hear you. Anyone else? Manny tried to talk, and the cat took his tongue and went to Chicago. No one. Okay, cool. So I'll tell you how I decide what I want. I look at the big picture values. Okay, so I'm religious. I believe in a creator, and I believe in a purpose for life, and I believe in you know, an eventual, you know, some kind of um, reckoning with what we do. And that, but what I really think is that we are, we end, we leave this life with what we've made out of ourselves. So when I think about deciding what I want, even in terms of money, even in terms of business, even in terms of all of those things, physical health, how fat I was once and how much weight I lost and uh, you know, my health back, all of those kinds of decisions. It is in the context of how do I want to be able to show up in my life now and to accomplish the thing I was put here to do. So I think of that question always in terms of how can I best do what I was put here on this earth to do. 
I'm not going to pretend to answer that for anybody else, but I know what I was put here on this earth to do. And so first, the first question I figured out for myself is, why am I here? Why am I here? And thinking of things in that context gives me direction at least, not complete and specific answers yet, but it gives me direction in terms of money, job, and that kind of thing. Let me give you some examples. So I turned down a job that was going to have me live in a place I didn't want to live. Uh, and my wife and I talked about it. I was offered a CEO position in a particular place. I didn't want to live there. It didn't feel right. It didn't feel like we could do the other things in life, so I turned that job down. That was a decision based on being able to do the things we wanted to do. So that's one small example of choosing something very concrete, money and job, based on another extrinsic value. We didn't want to be in that place because we didn't think it was conducive to other things we thought we should be doing here in our lives. All right, so I'm going to ask again, does anybody have any thoughts about how they decide what they want to do? Yeah, for me, and and I, those are questions that I ask my clients as well, and I have uh, a similar experience where a lot or even a majority of those clients can't answer that question. And, and so the, the path I lead them down is start thinking about what matters most, really, because <clears throat> when we do that, we get connected to what our the truth of our heart and our passion is. And what's behind that is our purpose. And I think that really echoes uh, what you just said, Kellen, which is, why am I here? That's the key question. Um, the people who are most successful and who have the most fulfilling lives are the people who figured out how to make what they love into their career, their job, their profession. And so that's what I always look for. And that's the bar I measure what I'm doing by. Great. Thank you, George. So here's what I want to suggest for all of you watching here in the film strip or later. Don't think this to death. Because you could spend the rest of your life trying to answer the question that I ask or the question that George asked, which is, why are you here? Well, gee, that means I have to decide whether or not there's a God and whether or not there was a creation and whether or not there's a purpose and whether or not we're going somewhere later and whether or not any of that matters and all that other stuff before I can decide, why am I here? It is easier than that. Okay, you can get to an answer, and it may change over time. Like I said, when you're younger, you have different goals. When you get a little older, you get a little wisdom and perspective. And so you change some of those things. But you stall, and you do nothing as long as you struggle with that answer. So we're not going to spend the whole time talking about that answer, although it would be very easy to philosophically pontificate in perpetuity. Write that one down, Manny. Pontificate in perpetuity about... <laughs> pontificate in perpetuity about the purpose of our existence, whether or not it was pointless or profound. There, there's an alliteration on a number of Ps that could last forever. Pontificate in perpetuity about the either pointlessness or profundity of our persistence in this planet. There we go. All right, anyway, <clears throat> the answer is pick one and try, because the fastest way for you to decide about whether or not something fits is just like at the store. Put it on and wear it, and wear something for a week. Feel how it resonates with you. Talk about it. Get passionate about it. Feel, and if it feels empty and hollow, it's like, duh, that suit doesn't fit. Thinking about it is not a way to do it. Trying it out is a way to do it. So in, in connect creating my business right now, the one that I use, the one that I do right now, I've gone through several iterations. I always have known that my great, my gift, my real gift, my zone of genius, if you've read The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks, my zone of genius is in helping people do things they don't believe they can do with tools they don't know they have and power they don't know they control. So then I dug down in that and I say, well, how do I do that? Well, I do that by... by um, helping people not focus on all the blocks and barriers, but on the possibilities. And then I dug down even deeper. So how does that work? Well, what I actually have a real skill doing is I have an ability to get people to see and then believe in this possibility they, they previously thought was impossible. 
Now, the tools of doing that are marketing for a business. It talks about the YouTube stuff that we talk about, or the marketing, or the language of the customer, or avatars, or skill in connecting, or rapport. All of those are tools to get to this essence for me. But I didn't know that when I started. So I started with, uh, I, I modeled different kinds of coaches. I tried different methods of doing things. And I put these jackets on in the store to see how they fit. And then I went out and wore them while I walked up and down the street and talked to people. And I thought, you know, there's some good in that, but there's a, there's a tweak I need to make here. So I was not afraid to try things on and get moving. So one of the great... Um, excuse me, problems is procrastination. And I don't know what the pro proliferation of peas has to do tonight, but whatever. One of the problems is procrastination and thinking that you have to have it all figured out. I think we call that perfectionism. So perfectionism either in product design, product creation, or in precise pinpointing of your purpose is not required before you start trying things. Think about a kid who gets up and walks. He doesn't have to have that all figured out and all the physics of where his butt needs to be so his center of gravity is okay so he doesn't fall on his face. Quite the opposite. He gets up and learns where that center of gravity needs to be because he fell on his face a few times. So we use the terms fail forward and we use the term fail fast. It's, it's no different when you're trying to figure out exactly what you want. Try some things out. Try some things out and see how they fit. So that, that's why it is important. The first thing I, I said is what difference does it make? It makes the difference. I'm going to quote George here. He said it means the difference between having a fulfilling life and, and simply living for other people. Okay, so I was talking to someone else who said to me the other day, I have lived my whole life being what I think other people thought I needed to be. And for the first time right now, I'm going to be... I think I'm going to be what I want to be, right? And that was a profound revelation for them. And so we might go, good. But I can tell you that lots of people, in fact, I would guess the majority of people, have never truly and deeply connected with the feeling of what is their own deep purpose for existence. What do you want to do? Because until you do that, you can't begin to do what George said, which is make a business or a life out of your passion, because nothing is easy to build. Okay, we've talked before about passion producing commitment, and that's backwards. Commitment produces passion. So if you think suddenly that you're going to get passionate, and that's going to give you the energy to get past all the problems that proliferate when you try to do something profound, uh, you're not. You have to get passion from a commitment. You've simply chosen, I'm going to keep running until I get to the finish line in this marathon. I'm going to keep swimming until I finish this 2.4 miles in the first piece of a triathlon. Or whatever it is that you're doing that's hard. That's really important to make the connection that passion comes from an absolute commitment to finish. So the reason it is important, the first answer, what difference it makes? It makes all the difference. It makes the difference in finishing hard things. It makes the difference in having a driving commitment that comes, or a driving ability to work through things, to make abstract connections, to see the benefit, and to rejoice in success. If you're not connected to the truth of why you're here, all of that becomes like not important. And then you get like, I know this because I personally experienced it. Okay, there came a time in my life when I was not connected. I was acting a part. I simply was doing stuff because I happened to be good at it. I was in what's called your zone of excellence. So I made a lot of money in a zone of excellence doing some things I really didn't care about. And it got so bad that I didn't care if I showed up or not even though I was getting really well paid to do a particular thing. So, can I, and I ended up telling myself, you know, I'm not feeling anything. I don't feel anything at all. I can act any way I need to act. So the answer to the first question, what differences it makes, makes all the difference in the world between having a fulfilling and real life and not. All right, I'm going to shut up. I'm talking too much. Uh, somebody else want to have some comments about this? Please do. I guess I chased Manny away. No, he's coming back, I'm sure. Rich? Rick? I am very much enjoying what I'm doing with the creative work that I'm doing, and I've been doing this for quite a while. And the, the struggle for me is figuring out how to, how to turn that into a revenue stream. And so I, I don't think I have a problem 
I don't think I have a huge problem finding what dry what uh, where my passion is and what my calling is. I, but I need to figure out how to do it in such a way as to as to make money consistently with it. And that is where that dichotomy is where I find myself stuck. Okay, that is profound, and it is also common. Um, there are lots of people that believe truly and sincerely that they have found their calling and passion in life, and they can't figure out how to monetize it. So <clears throat> that is, I'm not gonna. We're not gonna talk about that much tonight, and the reason is just because not enough time in a half an hour because I got to cover two other points here. But it's a good question. My best answer to you is the three C's. When people ask me how to get anything, how to get what they want out of life, the first thing is the first C is a commitment. I have to make a bulletproof commitment that I'm going to see this through, make whatever adjustments I have to on the way, but I'm committed. The second thing is complete clarity, and from your description it sounds like you may have that. Clarity about what you want to do and how that serves others and so forth. And the third C is get a coach. So commitment, clarity, and coaching are the three things that I always give to people as the ticket to doing what you've described. To first figuring out, I had it was interesting a conversation I had yesterday with that prospect. It's not a client yet, but probably is going to be. Um, <clears throat> he asked me straight up, well, do I need to have all that figured out before I start coaching? And I said, no. In fact, usually when you figure it out on your own because you haven't had the outside perspective, you end up having to redo half of that when you get coached anyway because you've used criteria for your decision that so much come from what others expect that you can't get fully committed to what you're doing anyway. So clarity or commitment, clarity and coaching are the way to get that. That's all the time we have to do on that right now. So how to decide is the second one. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about that. We've already covered a lot of pieces on that. George had some ideas and had some good comments about um, passion and uh, the connecting to your real purpose to go right down to that and leading a person through that. Uh, Rick said that he had found his creative purpose. Um, <clears throat> not being afraid to explore and being willing to try different things in my experience is a way to decide. The key piece for me is to act. Okay, So often uh, particularly <clears throat> some kinds of people, for some it's more than others, want to solve the dilemma by thinking. And I would maintain that you can't solve the dilemma of what you really want by thinking. Because even if you look back at, I'm going to refer to religion because I talked about that earlier, uh, Jesus in the Bible somewhere said, if any man will do the will, then he'll know. So he was talking about taking action. And action, in my mind, is the catalyst for knowledge. So action is the catalyst for knowledge. Until we act, we actually don't have all of the information we need to make a good decision. So action is a catalyst for knowledge. We can study all we need to, but then we need to act to make a, a, a correct or begin to make a correct decision. And that's true in marketing because when you act and put a product out there, you get market feedback to tell people, tell you if people like it or not or if it sucks. When you have purpose and you act in the direction of some purpose, then you get immediate feedback both internally and externally as to whether or not the jacket fits and so forth. So action is the catalyst for proper decisions is what I have to say about number two. Um, I'm going to open it to see if anybody has any comments. Sorry we lost many, but we've got four other active participants. Anybody got comments? When actions often come with a commit, uh, the cost of committing to that action. So what would you recommend for deciding between courses of action? The lowest cost or something else? You know, some of this is going to have to be intuition because an analysis, my experience, again, analysis alone does not provide the answer of what to do. It can often provide the answer of what not to do. So there's a decision process that corporations use, and it goes like this. You put down some non-negotiables. You put down a list of absolute non-negotiables, and you look at the alternatives, and you say, do these alternatives, are there any of the non-negotiables that are missing? And if they are, the, the alternative simply off the table, no matter how attractive it may be otherwise, 
if they're truly non-negotiable. Now, if you end up throwing an alternative away that is really attractive, then you have to go back and look at your non-negotiables and see if you really mean that. But the, again, that's a way to throw things off the table. It's not a way to decide the affirmative course of action. So I've done a lot of um, business stuff when I was a C-level exec in California, and we were deciding about market structures that were new in the electricity stuff when it was deregulated in 2000, 2001. There were lots of things that we had to do there just by intuition, and that was in something as complex and analytical as electricity. But it wasn't the electricity itself, because that's pretty well defined. It was the market design. So we had to do some things and make some leaps by uh, intuition and so no I would not I would personally not use the lowest cost I would simply uh, try to figure out how to mitigate my strategy in other words I'm going to try this and it's going to be a commitment of three months and a thousand dollars okay I'm going to try it as hard as I can for three months and a thousand bucks taking classes at college I think I'm going to major in mathematics Wow, I'm going to do that, and then I got to, I'm talking about me, so I'm going to major in math. I got a scholarship in mathematics. I did really well. Uh, wow, what am I going to do when I get a degree in math? Uh, be an actuary? Sit around and mathematize? I don't think I want to do this. But I had committed a bunch of money and a bunch of classwork, and I had a scholarship in it, so I had to change my mind. That kind of thing. So the commitment doesn't come free. It costs you some money, and it costs some time, but you have to try stuff on. So I would use intuition, not these costs, as the um, driver for making those decisions. Number three, I wrote down, learn what to do about it. And it is the process of deciding. So deciding a life purpose, what you really want, is a sort of abstract and fuzzy thing anyway. But this process of deciding can be drilled down to more concrete things. So as a coach, George, I know you know this, and um, Manny does too in some of his stuff that he's working on that I know about, you have to decide what you want to pursue. So one of the things I do with clients is I ask this particular fellow, and I ask all my clients this, so 91 days, not 100 years from now, just 91 days. Let's say we work together for 90 days. Day 91. What do you want to wake up and do? And you'd be surprised how many people, well, you know, I want to have some money. No, 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 no. What time do you get up? What do you do that day? And it's funny because I got a piece of homework from a client today uh, that, that finally answered that question. And they actually went through a week. My life in April 2015, Wednesday, I get up at 4.30, I go for a run, I then go to this place and I do these activities. And they had actually given it enough thought to paint a picture of what life looked like 90 days from now. And I said, that's really cool. And I love the fact that this particular person started in the middle of the week. It was like, why Wednesday? Who cares? Wednesday, I get up and then went Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And they went through the whole week. And so then I, I, you know, I read it and I asked some questions back and, and stuff like that. But that is, I said, now how does that feel? If you wear that life, how does that feel? And those are some of the ways to start deciding it, to get specific about it. So I, I, the process I went through to decide that I loved helping people maximize their gifts and talents was to remember the things in my life that had given me the most pleasure. So for example, I've owned a recording studio for a long time and I remember the joy that I had when a client did a great take or when we did a great mix and their face lit up or when I've worked with even volunteer choirs and I've done a lot of directing and they come up afterwards people say, oh that was the experience was so good more the people in the choir than even the listeners and the feeling that I got from helping that happen, you know, the accumulation of those experiences has made it really clear to me what drives my, what drives me. But it's just by doing it, and then the key was the actions that I had taken, and the result, the feedback I got from those actions. So that's what I choose to do about it. I've done almost all of the talking on this hangout, which I don't apologize for, but I want to invite participation more than we have. So let me open the floor for comments about any of this process, thinking about what we want to do, not taking too long to decide, how we should decide, and what to do about it.
floor's open. Well, I very much agree with um, your comments, Kellen. Uh, for me, and you know, again, the invitation I give to my clients is: never mind thinking it to death. What? How do you feel about this choice A, choice B? And if it's a long game or a short game, you know, does it really resonate with you? Does it light you up? And are you lighting other people up when you're doing what you're doing? So for me, it's very much about the feeling. And when you map out 91 days ahead, you really want to know right now today how you choose to feel in day 91. Do you choose to be feel lit up or stuck in another process? So I love what you said, and it really uh, it invited me to, to to go inside and and ask myself those questions again, which I do on a pretty regular basis. But it's timely this evening. Well, great, thank you for those comments, and I invite I do the same thing. So I try to to work myself that and I think in quarterly or sometimes six months you know day 181 I, what I find if I don't do that I find that I just keep doing the same things and I have these goals I want to make more money I want to get this many clients I want to take a vacation here I want to do this and the other but I don't ask the questions that George just said which is does that light me up if I think about April what's today October, November, December, New Year's so I'm going to get up on New Year's what am I going to do What's my life about? How many clients do I have? What are we talking about? What kind of clients are they? Where are they in their businesses? What am I doing in the studio? What's my music doing? How many songs have I got done? Uh, we're, Joey and I are thinking about opening another office in Canada, so we'll have an international location because I'm getting some clients up there, and, I, and we have family up there too, so I'm going to have two offices. But So what does that feel like? Is it going to be too much trouble traveling back and forth? What is that? How does that feel? And you know, this responsibility, where would we put things? It just that very thing that George was describing, putting it on, how does it feel? Does it light you up? Does it make you feel real? And then you just have to go with the feeling because at the end of the day, thinking that is not... Happiness, feeling is happiness. You feel happiness, you don't think happiness. So, Grizz, in terms of your question, I would really recommend a client, to a client, not to overthink it. Make a choice. And if your gut tells you it's the wrong choice, then don't do it. But you got to pick because the procrastination and the dancing between two choices um, doesn't do anything and if you have one of the things I find myself doing is I want to do this I know I want to do this and then I have this feeling in my stomach that says I think there's something wrong here I've been burned enough times that I know to go with the feeling of you know what I think there's something wrong here and and to follow that into the other one so that's what I think about that uh, uh, Richard anything else Rick I certainly appreciate all that you've uh, your examples, Kellen, because you you give me when I go back and listen to this again, it'll give me specific things to to use as reference points to to uh, to so that when I generate this list for myself, I can I can consider it from that kind of perspective because I I'm st I still find myself pretty close to the trees and and uh, and looking to take the where the forest is and I don't want to burn a bunch of time thinking about where the forest is I just want to I want to keep uh, exploring the trees and finding where I'm going so well that's good one of the things I would say just um, to you is you know if you can't figure out how to monetize what you love to do but you know you love to do it you need to get some help because uh, there's very few things Manny has the chipmunk I muted him. Manny, you have a chipmunkness about you tonight. So I muted you. <laughs> All right. Um, so get some help, dude. Get some help. Uh, you know, that would be my best uh, advice for you. Get some help figuring out how to monetize. Uh, and create. There's, there's ways to do it. I mean, I have hardly, I don't think I've ever met anybody that I've had serious discussions with that we can't come up with some ways to make money doing what they love to do. You know, I know somebody right now that makes a uh, makes some money. Listen to this: makes money having a podcast about astral projection. You know, I was in a. I don't know if you even know. Most people don't even know what astral projection is. 
Okay, and I was in a conference where I heard that. I actually heard it from Sam Crowley, who was a podcast expert, and he was talking about it, and he said, gave this example. And he asked in the room, there were 50 people in the room, anybody know what astral projection is? Well, I was the only one that raised my hand, and I happened to have read a book about some fantasy thing about astral projection, and it's an out-of-body experience where a soul goes into the astral plane and makes journeys and does stuff. Whether you believe in that or not doesn't matter. Somebody's making money doing a podcast about astral projection, for crying out loud. So, you know, there is a way. There's you know, like Captain Kirk, Star Trek Six. There's got to be a way. So anyway, um, <clears throat> anything else from anybody before we end it tonight? Manny, dude, are you there? I don't know. Am I? You are. We can finally hear you. The uh, your everything behind you is black, so your um, green screen black is black. Working. Black. Yeah, black, black on black. <laughs> on black. All right. Except for your face is well lit. You have a green halo around your head. Hey. So it's I like good. green. Green is for the money. Sorry. Green is for the money. So we're the, the t our time is up, but I want to give you a chance to speak since you've been laughing and having a great old time messing with your techno babble there. So speak. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm happy to be here as always. Um, you know, I always go down to the neuroscience. So when you were talking about the brain states, um, when you make a decision, you go, you change the brain circuits. You go from de deliberative phase, which is you're not really goal committed, into implementation phase. In implementation phase, everything you see, you funnel through the lens of opportunity. In, de in deliberative pre-commit phase, you're not quite sure, you don't notice the details, you may or may not, you know, you haven't made the commitment where you're being magnetized to the goal yet. So that's the first thing I heard today. You know, I love being right even without all the big long words. <laughs> I, I, the words make me feel better incrementally about, about the, the, you know, the checks I was writing them for like years. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I love it. Yeah, you know, but I love the way the words roll off your lip. I did, I did enjoy the giggle that you had about the proliferation of the peas. Yeah, that was pretty funny. All right, well, I'm gonna end the end the broadcast because we're over time. But anyway, thank you all. It was a great, uh, great, great time tonight. Good discussion.